Welcome to the Golf Improvement Podcast, episode 183. Welcome to the podcast for golf lovers and enthusiasts who are looking to take their games to new heights. Dedicated to custom club fitting, short game improvement, and effective practice to improve your golf game. This is the Golf Improvement Podcast with your host, Tony Wright. Hello, this is Tony Wright from Game Improvement Golf in Oak Ridge, Tennessee with the Golf Improvement Podcast, dedicated to sharing useful information on professional club fitting, short game improvement, and effective practice techniques. I create exceptional golf clubs. You shoot lower scores. Well, Dr. Rob Gray, an expert in perceptual motor learning skills and how to create them, did something exceptional when he wrote and published his new book, How We Learn to Move. He shared some of the fascinating information from his new book in his interview with me. The subtitle of the book is A Revolution in the Way We Coach and Practice Skills. I'm convinced that this is true. And you'll learn some of the reasons why it's true when you listen to this interview with Dr. Rob Gray. Taking your game to new heights, www.gameimprovementgolf.com. Hello, this is Tony Wright with episode 183 of the Golf Improvement Podcast. And get ready for a great discussion with Dr. Rob Gray, a professor at Arizona State University who does research and teaches courses related to perceptual motor skills. And he's done that for over 25 years. Um, He's the host and producer of his own podcast, the Perception and Action Podcast. But today we'll talk about his new book, How We Learn to Move, and, you know, the The Q line of this at the end is a revolution in the way we coach and practice sports skills. And boy, when I read it, you know, I saw things in there that I knew a little bit about, but you've really put in one place. So, Rob, thanks for writing this book. And I I think that people listening today are going to learn some things that they just didn't realize. So, welcome. (laughs) Thank you, Tony. It's my pleasure to be here. And yes, I hope uh, we can uh, give some people some ideas for sure. Yeah. Well, share a bit of your personal story. Uh, What drove you to create your career in experimental psychology, but focusing on visual control and movement? Yeah, so I'm from Canada originally, and I, you know, I went to, uh, when I went to university, so as an athlete, I played ice hockey and soccer mostly, as you did, I did at the time in Canada. And um, I had kind of always an interest in sports, understanding sports. Um, my own personal experience was I was I wasn't the fastest or the tallest or the strongest, but what kind of got me through and I and let me get to a reasonably high level was that I seemed to be kind of a step ahead of other people in, at some hmm. times. So I wanted to kind of understand that, and so I went to university and I kind of got interested in psychology in an indirect way. I had a really great professor when I took intro psych that studied vision in birds and, and oh, owls wow. and things. Yeah. So it was kind of, it got me really fascinated about that. So, so yeah, I went on to kind of do my, my PhD on, on vision, how we kind of judge mo- motion perception and things like that. And I kind of early in my career, I realized to get funding and things I I would need to kind of expand beyond sports. So I really considered myself like a performance psychology. So I, I did a lot of research on driving safety. I work with the Air Force a bit with pilots. And more as I've gotten through my career, I've been able to come back to um, this, my real interest in sports. And so I've gotten more into understanding, trying to understand skill acquisition and motor learning, how we get good at things. And I also say I like, I've been doing some work on why we go bad, <laughs> right? Things like pressure. Yeah. Which is like as that. interesting as, as how we get good, I think. Yes, I think so. It's probably as important, yeah. So, so yeah, so I've kind of – it's been a very crazy journey, like not uh, unplanned, lots of turns and twists, um, but it, it's a lot of fun. I really have a lot of fun with my job. 
Now, you started your podcast back in 2015. You've got like 330, 40, 50 episodes. But, I mean, was the podcast the genesis of writing the book or, you know, somewhere in that in, in that time frame you thought, you know, maybe I really put all this together or, you know, how did, how did the book come about in terms of what got you really juiced to start writing it? Yeah, very much so. So I started the podcast really as just a supplement to teaching. I teach online some courses. So I had I would do recordings of lectures and I had to do some new ones. So I thought, why don't I just throw them out there to the world? And I just planned on doing a few and stopping. And then I got so much great interaction from people. I realized there's this huge um, interest and desire for dissemination of research, right? Being able to distill things down and give people the key points out of research studies and journal articles. So I started doing that. And w- along that way, I got a lot of questions. A very common question I had was, you know, I'm really interested in some of these ideas, you know, whether it's self-organization or the constraints approach, where do I start? And I always had trouble giving people that answer, because there's a lot of great books out there, but they're very high level. And this and this is, you know, there's a lot of terminology in this area. So it, it was hard to get started. And the other thing I really, as I was doing the podcast and looking for new topics that were kind of out of my area of research, my direct area, I realized how big this encompassing this these ideas were. It goes beyond just practice design to also implications for injury prevention implications for how we use technology and analytics, like how you use a blast monitor in golf. Um, so I, I, I really wanted to pull that all together. I don't see really anything that really um, pulled the whole story together. So those were kind of, and they, so they kind of, a lot of the chapters are kind of evolved out of podcast episodes for sure. You know, and we're not really going to get you did mention injury prevention. That was one of the fascinating parts, and I don't think we're going to dive in there. But we'll leave that for people to, to to realize that there's some really fascinating things you talk about in the book related to injury prevention and and doing things over and over the same way. So let's mm-hmm. we can kind of That's sneak that in there and tell people that you know if yeah. you want to know that you might get into there. Um, well, you know, as I read the book and tried to create questions to talk about you. I mean, this sort of first question, it I, it wrapped up a lot of things for me. And it is, you know, I think we are all, as humans, designed to learn to move and to create skills. And obviously, we do that. We, we ride bikes. We tie shoelaces. We learn to drive. But when we get into stuff related to sports, somehow how people think we should learn to move and the concepts for learning to move have – have somehow gotten skewed, messed up, okay? Um, share some of your kind of overall thoughts about, you know, why poor concepts have been used to learn to move and create skills. Yeah, I think we've kind of we've, we've kind of moved to this model. You know, the two kind of things I really try to challenge in the book is the idea of repetition, right? The idea that you get good by trying to learn the one correct way to swing a golf club and just repeat it over and over, right? And getting to the idea that comes from uh, this researcher I talk a lot about in the book, Nikolai Bernstein, that actually to be good, you you can't repeat the same movement because the conditions are always changing. You need to be able to adapt your movement to different conditions. And we don't really give people a much chance to, to do that the way we practice. And the other one is this idea of automaticity that, you know, I have to – learn the skill and lock it away, right? And it becomes automatic. Like I'm a, I'm a soldier, I dr- you drill it into you so that it comes out without you really thinking about it. So I kind of try trying to challenge those ideas. And one of the things I always like to point to is, is learning to run. Like pe- when people learn to run, did they parents set cones out on the driveway <laughs> so they could run around? Did they get a lot of instructions about where your knee, what your knee should be doing when your foot is on the ground, right? No, we just kind of learned it. Like we, we figured it out on our own bike and we learned how to change our running stride to run downhill without falling down, right? So the, we seem to have developed this kind of robotic, <laughs> a repetitive way of learning that I don't think fits well with what we're designed to do as human beings. Yeah, and it's funny because I'm sitting in my, in my basement, you know, and, and I have some new little things that I'm trying to learn related to some of my golf swing stuff. And every time I'm doing that now, I'm thinking about 
things I read in the book and <laughs> thinking about, you know, I'm, for example, I'm kind of a big fan of something I've always called Goldilocks type drills, okay? Uh, you know, like in putting, hit it a little further than the, the hole, hit it a little shorter, hit it a little uh, the same distance, and the same thing with other kind of ways that, that are, are very, you know, not exactly variable, but do different things to try to learn mm-hmm. the feel of, of, of doing it the way you wanted to do it when you were in competition, okay? And, For sure. And that just makes a lot of sense to me. Um, yeah, no, I think it does. I think that fits well with the, the one of the basic messages of the variability of practice. Yeah, you learning to do the wrong thing, it paradoxically will help you learn to do the right thing, right? Learning to put the ball away too short or way too long requires you to learn the relationship between how your body moves and this outcome which I think will allow you to learn just how you swing when you're on a downslope, right? It's the same. Yeah. It's a movement problem. You're creating your own movement problems in practice and figuring out how to solve them. And I think that's a much better way to practice than trying to produce the exact same outcome over and over. Yeah. Now, early in the book, you, you mentioned, and coming back to repetition a little bit, repetition is, is not only not the key to becoming <laughs> skillful, but it's impossible <laughs> okay and and people don't realize that we never make the same movements you know mm-hmm. and, and and you talk about skillful behavior is adaptive responsive and intelligent not rote repetitive and automatic um so share a little bit more there and maybe dive a little more into skills and habits which you talked a little bit about a few minutes ago but maybe go a little more into that yeah, the, so the um, that comes from, from Bernstein, again, the basic idea that we can't repeat a movement because the conditions are always changing, both externally, the environment around us, and internally, the, you know, the f- level of fatigue, the background level of noise in our, in our nervous system. And, and I, I, I tried to highlight in, you know, things like uh, your heart rate. You're, surprisingly to most people, your heart does not beat at the same timing like a metronome. It's actually highly variable from the timing of your heartbeat. Yeah. Um, if it is regular, that's a so- sign of serious health condition that you need to go see a doctor about. So the what we call heart rate variability is, is an important function. So, yeah, so that's that's kind of the basic idea is that <laughs> the, the, these always changing, the word we use is constraints, mean that you can never move in the exact same way each time. Yeah, the slightly different movements are required to produce the same thing. And so so that's the idea of, of, of being skillful and adaptive, being able to make these adjustments rather than having these, you know, the, all in the moment adjust to the, the environmental conditions, the change in constraints, rather than having these stored plans for swinging, right? Okay, here's how I hit on a downhill eye. Here's how I hit on an uphill eye. Right, right. Having these um, kind of habits built up, um, being more so you can adjust to different lies, right? At different uh, degrees of downhill line, so on, to be adaptable. So that's kind of the idea of having this, uh, learning this relationship between your movement and the environment. Really, the connection between you, you and your environment is really something to try to stress. Yeah, and, and and you talked about constraints there, and that was a big theme in the book too, um, and. You know, there were two particular chapters that kind of dive into a little bit. You talk about freedom through constraints, which I mean, whoever says that, <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, it's not a, it's not a phrase you would hear, but but talk about why that was really important to you in terms of bringing that out. Yeah, that's a the constraints word is a one that gives a people a lot of confusion because it sounds bad, right? I'm constraining you, um, but the idea is so if we start with the idea that there's lots of there's not one correct technique, so there's not one correct golf swing, um, then we turn we created a different problem now, the problem of choice basically. How do we know what to do then? How do we know how much we should bend our elbow? What we should be doing with our wrist? How much we be, be rotating and so on? So we have this problem. Of choice, which we know human beings are not very good at when we give us lots of choices. So what uh, what a constraint does is actually it helps the athlete by taking away a choice um, for how to move. 
And we there's research showing we do this ourselves when we're first learning a skill, right? We do what's called freezing degrees of freedom. So we 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 make the choice of how to move easier by taking some joints out of the equation, right? So we lock our arms and, and lock our knees. And the classic example, if you watch someone dance or downhill ski for the first time, you get this very awkward movement, right? Where everything's moving together and it's not very, um you know, rhythmic or, or very creative because we're just trying to get moving, right? So we, we kind of constrain ourselves and this, so you can do it to ourselves and also coaches can do this to try to, um, you know, get people on the field, get people going and get people playing, right? And one of the examples I always like to use in golf is, you know, Tiger Woods and his dad, right? Tiger Woods' dad wanted Tiger to start playing right away on real golf courses, but he knew that he wouldn't be able to handle it. So he changed a constraint of the of the golf by changing the par, right? He made something called Tiger Par where he added two, you know, this par five is a par seven for you, right? So he, he, he changed the constraints to kind of, you know, give him more, uh, get him on the field, get him, allow him to do things. So, so that's kind of the, the basic idea. It's, it's kind of taking, by taking something away, it's allowing you to get some proficiency and explore different solutions. Excuse me, I got a little bit of a tickle today. It's unusual. Oh, no problem. <laughs> <clears throat> um, it, you know, in some of the world that I live in, in terms of, for example, putting coaching, now, though, sometimes, you know, there's a difference, I think, between the right use of training aids, for example, and, and their importance as constraints, right? Because you can get so constrained that you're trying to lock in the exact motion, right? Mm-hmm. And and that's where it that's where it gets a little tricky, and maybe not tricky, but being careful about how you do that. And you might practice, for example, different motions, right? Like mm-hmm. if you're putting, um, practice an out to in stroke or an inside out, in inside to outside stroke, and and get the different feels of that to try to get something that's more natural for you, right? Does, does that make sense to you? For Rather sure, than yeah. saying just a perfect, this perfect arc. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And I highlight that, you know, the most extreme example of that I highlighted in the book, the the robot. Oh, yeah, that's right. For golf, a robo golf, I think it's called. So there's this device that you, it, it's a robot arm holding a golf club and it will actually move the club through kind of the ideal path. <laughs> you can set it to any golfer you want, I think. And what you find is that doesn't really help people. Um, going through using some device to make you, like you said, one, figure one solution. What helps people is using those devices, like you said, get people to explore and try different things and and learn about the relationship, the kind of we call it the solution space, the relationship between your body movement and the outcome. You know, how do I hit an inside out putting stroke and make it, or how do I hit a purposely hit a little fade or a slice, you know, a hook? Um, you know, the, those things kind of help you learn about your movement and, and how to problem solve, like I said earlier. Yeah. And, mm-hmm. and then the other part of constraints that was my favorite chapter of the book, actually, was, um, was chapter 10, where you talk about what I think you have is a, a new perspective on being creative and factoring in constraints to help you learn to be creative um maybe talk about one of the examples from the book there i mean obviously the the fosbury one i think is in there but there's there's more than one but but what's the importance of constraints in terms of being creative yeah so the the kind of the idea there is the the to change the idea that creative creativity is like a mental internal mental process like the athlete sits down on the bench and thinks up something creative to do um, to the idea so you know I the kind of thing was I uh, sometimes in presentations like you know the traditional model of creativity is probably Rodin's the thinker right someone sitting there yeah. with their hand <laughs> versus you know I think the new view is is the explorer right creativity comes from adding constraints that encourage athletes to explore their environment. So there's a bunch of nice work on on soccer, for example, where you show, you compare kind of traditional coaching where you're giving people the instructions um, to learn how to pass and shoot, and then you watch them how they play afterwards versus um, constraints that approach using things like 
um, reducing the number of players, reducing the size of the field. So you're not telling people what to do. You're just con- doing different constraints to get them to, to kind of try different things. And not surprisingly, you find that in the end, the latter one makes gets more creativity, right? People do things um, very f- rare kind of passes, passing with the outside of their foot versus the inside of their foot and, and things like that. So there's kind of a growing body of evidence that um, if we want, and it just makes total sense, right? If you if you want creative athletes, you have to ha- allow them to be creative in practice, right? Let, allow them to make decisions, explore, not tell them pr- and prescribe all the things you want them to do, you know? So I think I think that's a, a really interesting new kind of and, area of research. And kind of come up with just overall come up with different solutions, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Solutions that nobody would have thought about. Yeah. It's pretty, it's pretty exciting, really. Yeah, mm-hmm. for sure. Now, you're not like – you think there's a lot of ways that coaches can be a little better than they are, <laughs> okay? And it's – in many ways, I think that's, again, because of the sort of general models of what it is to be a coach, right? But they should be more designers and guides rather than instructors. Um, and and it, I finally realized that that's sort of related to what I believe is your personal sort of mantra, keep them coupled, right? Mm-hmm. Um, share a little bit about the role of keep them coupled in terms of effective coaching and designing practice environments. Yeah, so the idea there is, you know, we move with a purpose. It has a function and it's driven by by information, right? We, we um, you know, we uh, play, you know, in the classic example is I like to use in soccer, right? or any kind of agility, I, when I go left, right, it's because you're coming at me for the right, from the right. I'm trying to get away from you, and it's driven by information I pick up from watching you, right? So that's what we mean by coupled. Information and action are coupled. The perception and action are coupled. But what we tend to do in training is we tend to decouple them, right? We tend to take you, um, on, instead of playing against another player, we have you dribble around a cone, right? There's no reason there's no functional reason to go left versus right around a cone it doesn't matter (laughs) and there's no information from the cone telling you whether to go left or right you've kind of broken this natural coupling apart and i think you know you can do this in golf too by just hitting shots with no real purpose or intent um you know just hitting it straight um over and over i think you're kind of taking away the you know the information that person gets from the environment to help control their actions. So so that's kind of the basic idea of that. Well, we want to keep uh, the movement actions you make, the movements you make purposeful and functional by keeping it linked to the information from the environment. And and when it, before I started, you know, about 5 minutes before I I um clicked the button to start talking, I was trying to look for a, a a definition of perception, and there's a real simple one, right? Perception is the sensory experience or your sensory experience of the world. And I'm mm-hmm. sure that's why, you know, that that's in the title of your podcast. You're trying to experience what's going on there and react to it and create actions, right? Yes, yeah. So the, the idea that, you know, perception we're talking about, you know, how you perceive the distance or slope on a green, right? How you're you're picking up something you see is telling you, you know, the line of the putt, right? You're perceiving that. Um, and so that, that's kind of the idea. Um, so a putting green, right? You, you, a basic putting green, flat putting green, you're not learning to control the putting by picking up the information about slant and slope. Um, so yeah, that's what we mean by perception, really picking up information from your environment that allows you to control your actions. Well, so let's end before, you know, talking about where we can find you and your book and things. Any other, you know, now that you, you know, you obviously knew I've sort of got a golf focus. <laughs> Any other kind of final words and final guidance and thoughts for people, you know, particularly those people who go out in the range and hit 100, 100 balls and think they're really getting better and how to use those 100 balls a little more effectively or different things they can do. And maybe different things they can do on the golf course, too. Yeah, so I'll give you a couple of things. One is the, the kind of things you were talking about, Tony. The try, try varying it up. Try, you know, we have this kind of, I talked, I've talked about this before. We, we kind of have this view that once we get a swing down, it's like this fragile piece of glass, right? We don't want to mess with it. 
Whereas I think messing with it really helps, right? Trying to try different stances, try to achieve different things in practice, play around a little, I think is beneficial. Um, I think, you know, and, and really, um, yeah, I think that can help a lot. The other thing I think important with golf, especially is now with a lot of the technology coming out, you know, you can get iPhone apps that will do kind of a biomechanics analysis of your golf swing. Be, be very careful with how you use that, right? Don't become over dependent on it. You know, we don't want you focusing too much on the mechanics of your swing. You know, there's lots of research showing that's not a good thing. So, you know, focus on the goal, you know, what your goals are and playing golf. You know, focus on playing golf, not swinging um, is, I think, a, an important message. And so, yeah, I'd be kind of be careful with that. You know, that's useful for a coach to help give you cues and design practices, but it's, it can be a bit dangerous when you use it on your own, I think. I think it kind of comes down to we, we really are kind of learning machines, right? Mm -hmm. And if we put ourselves in an environment to be learning, then we'll keep finding ways to improve and to find other ways to do it, maybe get a little better rather than just mm -hmm. the rote, do it over and over, and that's going to make me better. Yeah, for sure. And uh, we are, and then we're very efficient learners too, right? If you put you put someone in an environment where they don't really need to learn <laughs> lots of variations and they could simply do it, that's what they'll do, right? They're not going to come up with a really complex solution when it's not required. So you're right. You have to kind of push people a little bit to, to, to challenge them and, and grow and, and develop, you know. The other thing, you know, I guess the with practice is, uh, you know, this across all the sports I work in is just be a bit more purposeful, right? What are you What are you trying to work on when you hit those hundred balls on the range? You know, is there something in your golf game that's you're struggling with? You know, putting spin on the ball, whatever it is. You know, instead of just going out and practicing to eat up time, you know, be more a bit more deliberate about it. You know, this is sometimes the word you see in that the literature. You know, focus on working different things. That's that's the biggest thing that I've noticed with really elite athletes that I've been able to work with. Yeah, I, I work mostly in baseball, and the um, really elite hitters have a, a, something they want to work with, work on every time they go up. They're going to take, not swing at inside pitches or something like that. Yeah. right? They, they, rather than I'm just going to go up and swing, they have a, have a plan of a purpose for the practice. Boy, and they have such a small window, don't they? <laughs> for sure. <laughs> uh, and, and you talked about that. Maybe we. Maybe that's one final thing to talk about. You know, sometimes they see the ball. I mean, it's not exactly golf, but sometimes mm -hmm. they see the ball as being like a grapefruit, and sometimes they see as b the ball as being like the size of a golf ball, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So there's this kind of chapter I talk about in the book of this idea of embodied perception. And is, we don't actually perceive the world in terms of physical sizes and distances and slopes, we perceive what the opportunities for action. So for feeling really good, the ball looks bigger, right? Because there's more opportunities for action. So yeah, baseball is really interesting. And I find that the goal, compared to golf, you know, golf should be trivially easy. The ball is just sitting there. Ha, ha, ha. It's not coming out of, but for some reason it's in a lot of ways harder than hitting a hundred mile an hour fastball because it's just this tantalizing non-moving thing in front of you that you should be able to hit easily every time but but it's we can of course and so that's yeah. a really interesting a contrast and somehow that little brain that's up there <laughs> puts other yes. pieces you know other constraints in there maybe i don't know if that's the right word right <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah well your book yeah i mean I was so tickled when I first heard about it. I read it right away. I mean, I, I wanted to do that before I talked with you. And it is a fascinating book for anybody wanting to learn, you know, how we do move and, and other ways to help being a great coach, okay, for people and a great instructor. So, uh, you know, I'll put links in the show notes to your book, to your to your website. Um, hey, uh, there might be a new book one of these days again, too. Isn't that right? I think you mentioned that. Yeah, yeah, I have a I have a baseball Some other ideas. one I'm working on right now, but I have another one, a <laughs> follow up to this one, definitely coming. That will it'll be a focus a bit more on kind of elite, um, not just kind of how you start and learn to move. It's how you come, you know, a bit uh, get to the next level. I think I would I would say that's going to be fun to read. And and you have something else in the book called Exploration Guides, and and if people want to kind of really dig a little deeper. It's some really neat little um, pieces at the end of it where they can find, you know, things they could d dive into and other resources and other documents and, 
and things to to get in there a little deeper if they want to do that. Yeah, for sure. The the exploration is a dominant kind of theme throughout the book, you know, getting people both as an athlete and learning, you know. So um, as I said, there's lots of great material already out there. So hopefully this is kind of a springboard to people looking more at those things. Well, Rob, thanks for taking the time to do this today. Um, I'm looking forward to making this live on my website, and I'm looking forward to just, you know, I, t- being a little more into looking at your podcast myself, too, because there's a lot of great things that you're doing there and people that you're talking to. So thanks again for, for the book and for talking with us all today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on. The Golf Improvement Podcast is sponsored by Tony Wright and Game Improvement Golf. Tony creates exceptional golf clubs. You shoot lower scores. Rob, thanks for the work that you do and for sharing so much great information from your new book. It was actually difficult to narrow down the scope of this interview with Rob to a few items. There is so much more we could have talked about that you would have learned from. But I guess I'll mention one thing. Early on, we talked about the fact that no one makes exactly the same swing twice. So trying to be perfect is not what you're looking to do. It's actually working to develop skills. And even if you develop a great skill, you won't make exactly the same swing every time you do it. And the, I guess the other thing that I think I would like you to think about is when you practice, sometimes maybe practice doing things just a little bit wrong. I'm finding that's really helping me in terms of the sh- some of the short game practicing that I'm doing. There are things that I know that when I do them, I won't hit the ball well. And I practice trying to experience the feel of those things. So something to consider. This is definitely a book worth reading, especially if you have a passion for understanding skills creation and how to teach and coach them. There are links in the show notes to Rob's website where he posts his always interesting Perception and Action podcast episodes and to where you can buy How We Learn to Move on Amazon.com. My shout out today is, well, it's just good to be getting to do this episode. About two weeks ago, I had a really bad reaction to a medication I was taking, and I'm just getting back to good health. It's no fun to have rashes over much of your body and not know when they'll go away. But this was all kind of a wake-up call for me, or at least I hope it is. I've decided to start a fitness program, And what I'm doing is using the fitness program, one of the ones that Jeff Pelazaro has developed, the Activate program. So as you're listening to this, I'm starting into week one of that effort. And it's something I really have to do. But if you want to ask me from time to time, how's it going? Please do that. I need people to hold me to task. And I need to hold myself accountable for doing this too. It's important. Well, that's it for today. In two weeks, it's the end of the year. And so coming up is my annual end of the year interview with good friend and German PGA professional Mike McFadden, who will share some of his personal best ways and tasks to create golf skills to help you to shoot lower scores. So take care and stay safe. Game Improvement Golf, your source of information and inspiration to become an exceptional golfer now. www.gameimprovementgolf.com